Before I start, I want to go over a couple of things. I um, need to just say I'm nervous. I couldn't have done this a year ago because last year I took Toastmasters and I started from really shy and I now got my competent communicator. So it really helped. When I went in, I thought everybody was supposed <laughs> Thank you. I thought everybody was supposed to be like these aggressive speakers there. And I was like, why do I want to go in that group? And it turned out everybody was shy and couldn't, you know, had trouble speaking. And people from their department said, you should go to do this and it'll, be, it'll help you, you know, when you present stuff. And it was really helpful. The other is that um, I do the beginning part of the animated movies. Um, and I just draw these rough little drawings. And soon gave me a lot of credit, and I appreciate that. But every single department, every person in every department at Disney takes what we do as a storyboard artist and make it better. And so what you see on the, the, um, the screen is a compilation of um, more than 100%, because every department adds 100% to it. So it's, it's really a collaborative effort. OK, I've got these wrong. I, Unfortunately, today we're doing a double clicking here. OK, so hopes and dreams and terror. I'm a visual storyteller. I draw storyboards for the Walt Disney Company, and I've worked for others. It all started when I was five years old. And I got into animation to work out traumas from watching Snow White as a kid. It was, and I used to say that kiddingly, and I realized it was true. Um, because it was a really scary movie. You know, like, there's the, the magic mirror. Ugh. And, um, oh wait, this one, that's uh, a note to myself, sorry. It's not, doesn't belong there. So. <laughs> okay, um, so being a visual person, I thought what I'd do is show you my talk, okay? So um, I'm gonna have to go over here a little bit. And let's do this. Up here is where we're gonna start. Down here, you're going to laugh. And you should have laugh there and there. And then finally, when we get up there, you may get choked up a little bit, hopefully. And at the end, where that X is marking the spot, there I have a great surprise for you, OK? <laughs> First time I've ever talked about it in public like this. OK. So first, to do a little tour. This is Walt Disney Feature Animation Building, also known as the Hat Building. This is where a lot of the uh, Silver Age classics were done, like Aladdin and Lion King. I'm going to show some more. OK. Um, this is the Team Disney building. It is also known as the Dwarf Building, because as you can see, there's the little, the all seven dwarfs up top. Everything at Disney is branded. This is Mickey Avenue and Dopey Drive. And <clears throat> OK. Oops. This one went too fast. Just keep, bear with me for a minute on this. OK. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right, so Disney's branding is everywhere. And it makes you feel good to see these characters that you know and love. And I thought, why can't, you know, it used to, companies used to have iconic characters that represented them, like Snap, Crackle, and Pop. Why not do that nowadays? This building here is the old animation building, where all Disney's Golden Age classics were made. And the far corner up there, which I'll point in for you, is where Walt's office was. And peop some people say that on nights with a full moon, they can even see him pacing back and forth in his office. Uh, even the water tower has Mickey on the top of it. And this next slide is the most important slide of most important building at Disney. This is the studio commissary. <laughs> that fuels the whole process. This now is where I work, OK? But this is where I show up for work. But where I really work is here in Enchantia. Uh, that's the home of Sophia the First. It's a Disney preschool show. And I storyboard on the show. And this is Sophia with me here. And Sophia's mom married the king. So she became an instant princess. Now, it's not easy to become a princess, particularly when you have a stepsister like Amber. Now, what I do, thought I would do is show you kind of what Amber is like, OK? So in this episode, her mom and um, Sophia and Amber have gone out sailing, and they get captured by pirates, OK? So I'm gonna, here's a little bit of what Amber is like. This is kind of what I, you'll see what I do. So <clears throat> the pirate comes up to them and goes, we are pirates, and I be their captain. 
how do you think I got this? And Amber, being herself, goes, that doesn't even look like a real pirate's hook. Amber, be quiet. Yeah, of course it not be a hook. It's much more practical. Have you ever tried to eat with a hook? And Amber nonchalantly pushes the pirate's hand down. I just thought that a real pirate would have a real hook. And he's kind of startled by this. Rawr, I be a real pirate. And Miranda uh, guards her daughters. And he's like really getting angry. Rawr. And ah! he starts sobbing. Oh, I be a real pirate. I be a real pirate. I be a real pirate. And he falls on the ground. So that's a little sample of what I do at work. It all starts with a script. And I get a script from the writer. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, they jumped ahead. Wow, that jumped ahead several. Sorry about this. OK, so I get the script from the writer. And on the side of the script, I'll draw little thumbnail drawings about the uh, size of a, post, a postage stamp. And that's where I'm working out my thinking. And that's where I'm actually playing director, because the storyboard artist is the first pass at directing a film. And then the director, of course, comes in and changes everything. OK? <laughs> OK, so here's some other samples. And once I do these drawings, I will then uh, come onto my computer monitor, and I have what's called a Cintiq monitor. And I'll actually draw right on the screen so I can see what I'm drawing. And it's a very nice way to draw. Um, I also love the undo function, so it's, I'm using that like my eraser a lot. And here's one more sample of that. That was an episode where Sophia shrank really little. And then what I do is, like you saw in the pirate sequence, I clean them up. This is a little section from Rio. I clean up the drawings on the Cintiq, and it's kind of like doing a, a comic book. Then I'm showing a sequence of what the action is happening in a series of images. It's the guide for the whole animation process. Everybody then follows that process. What happens is we will take all those drawings, bring it into editorial, and they'll basically make a complete animated you know, film using these still images. And then we'll add the voices and the, sound, um, the, uh, the music to it. And so you actually watch that, and you get a sense of how your film is turning out. So why do we tell stories? It's all about wishes. In fact, psychoanalyst Adam Phillips said that stories are, all our stories are about what happens when we wish. And I thought that was really brilliant, really insightful. And there was one other uh, person that knew this really well. Nobody knew it better than him. It was Walt Disney. Because he has inspired generations with his stories about wishes. In Snow White, I'm wishing for the one I love. And Pinocchio when you wish upon a star. A dream is a wish your heart makes from Cinderella. But stories always have a meanwhile. Dun, dun, dun. It's hard to coordinate the two. Um, you have to be careful what you wish for. Because stories are all about hope. And for there to be hope, we also need to have fear. And so Walt knew we needed terrifying villains like Monstra the Whale, or even scarier, Stromboli in Pinocchio. And who can forget the evil stepmother of <coughs> Cinderella? So I work now in the happiest place on Earth. They say Disneyland is, but actually where we work is. Um, so I told you I got into animation to work out traumas from watching Snow White. Well, I finally got a chance to work for Disney and I got out of college, and I worked for another animation studio for a while. And it was truly a magical place. I learned more there in the first six months that I worked there than in my entire schooling career. It was just everybody was so talented, and they shared what they knew. And it was just a wonderful place. <clears throat> and I started creating what's called visual development. I was put in the visual development part department. And our job was to basically do the casting like a live action movie. So we would try out different designs for what the genie might look like. Here's one I played with, with uh, genie is an Elvis impersonator. 
um, here, um, well, let me go back, okay, was one of the early designs I did for Jasmine. And here was another one for Jasmine. We also designed kind of ca gags. Um, I thought it would be funny to have some camel surfing going on in, in some of the scenes. And we explored lots of these, and you just kind of create stuff. And then you'd get feedback from the directors what they liked and didn't like. And here's one of Jafar. And after the visual development was taking place, I then got to go into the storyboarding, because the directors had finished writing the script, and now it was time to actually start making the movie. <clears throat> um, I told you you need to be careful what you wish for, because my wish for, to work for Disney came with its own set of terrors. And these terrors weren't from Jafar. They were from the directors, Ron and John, Ron Clemens and John Musker. I pitched my first storyboard, and it was a bungled mess. I didn't know about screen direction. I didn't know how to pitch to them. Um, there were just so many things wrong with it. And I remember to this day, John turning to Ron and saying, well, I don't know if Francis can, can storyboard. And I was like, oh, just stab me in the heart, you know? Uh, and, and so luckily, they put me back into visual development again. It's no longer the happiest place on earth. Um, <clears throat> So I started doing, they, they gave me a scene to develop, and I'm starting to put, do the scenes. This was the pre-digital age, where we'd actually work on large four by eight uh, foot cork boards, and we'd do these drawings. So I would do these pans of like, you know, uh, kind of the Agrabah setting and stuff, and other gag ideas and stuff. And I'm looking at it, and I start saying, this is all flowing, it's connecting. And so what I did was I added a few extra drawings here and there, and when they came in to see what I had done in visual development, I pitched them a storyboard sequence. And I'm going to show you what I pitched to them, a section of it, right now. From Aladdin, this is a scene where Jasmine was in her garden, tending to her animals. And Aladdin, who has been rejected earlier, comes back. He's disguised as Prince Ali. <clears throat> he wants to get a second chance with Jasmine to prove that he really is worth it. And they're talking, and she's complaining about how she hates being cooped up in the palace all the time. And Aladdin thinks about this, and he looks up into the sky, and there's his carpet. And he goes, ah, I have an idea. How about we go for a ride? <clears throat> and he whistles. There we go. Um, and the carpet comes down, and introdu he introduces Jasmine to the carpet. The carpet bows graciously. <clears throat> Jasmine perks up, this is great. And we're a little ahead here. Okay, so um, that one, this one, sorry about that. Um, and they're off. They go flying into the Arabian night sky. She hangs on tight, she leaves her animals behind, and she is thrilled with this. And they proceed to have the most magical date in the world, traveling all around the world. And that night they return home to her palace and it's really beautiful. They fly across the moon, and he drops her off at her balcony. And they speak for a little bit, and Aladdin could use a little nudge, so the carpet helps him out there, pushes him right up to Jasmine, and they kiss. And it's a truly magic moment. They're startled a little bit by it, and Jasmine says good night. And Aladdin is totally in love. But you know, in stories, the good times can't last, right? Terror at Disney continues with the Gong Show. The Gong Show was an in-house forum where anybody who worked at Disney, from head animator to secretary, could pitch an idea for a feature movie. And I decided, I'm going to do this. What an opportunity. And so I went, and it just got scarier. Um, what happened was, I look across who I'm pitching to, and there is Roy Disney, Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Peter Schneider, the head of Disney, as well as a few other executives. And I'm like, ugh. I, sorry. Um, it was really a tough room. And 
This is kind of a little bit how it felt to see them there. But actually, they were very gracious. I don't know if you, if you know that Jeffrey Katzenberg has an, um, an addiction to Diet Coke. At seven in the morning, he'll have one. And he only gonged his Diet Coke once, OK? Um, and I got to see Mike Gabriel pitch. Um, oops, sorry. Oops. That one. OK, sorry. here. OK, I got to watch Mike Gabriel pitch Pocahontas. He said, Pocahontas is the story of star-crossed lovers, just like Romeo and Juliet. And he showed this little poster here, which looks like Tiger Lily from Peter Pan, and the cute little animals, and they bought it on the spot. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, OK, wait a minute. We're the happy ever after company, right? And we're going to do a tragedy? I didn't understand it, but they did it. My thought was, this is really strange. You know, this, People die in tragedies, and we can't have this. So I was actually working on Pocahontas at a little later, and I decided to ask my boss for feedback. So I went to his office and um, asked for feedback. I'm not sure why I did this, but I did. And what happened, you notice the, the Mickey brand there? He, he told me my storyboards were fine. And I'm thinking, OK, great. But he said, sometimes they're emotionally cool. And it's like, the last thing you want to hear as a storyboard artist is that your storyboards are emotionally cool unless, yeah. wait a minute, OK. That's not the next, oh, did I miss? OK, yes, all right, I'm sorry. I'm out of sync here. Unless you're actually working on Frozen, OK? Then the storyboards are emotionally cool is fine. OK. So this was the storyboard as for, um, for Pocahontas, the way it was scripted. And it was really like the ending of a summer camp movie. And I'm thinking, we're doing the first sad Disney ending ever, and it can't be like a summer camp movie. So I remember my boss saying my boards were emotionally cool. And I thought about it. We were throwing away the ending here. This, um, this is emotionally cool. I'll take you through it, why it kind of was failing. First of all, you're, I'm, I'm hoping many of you saw Pocahontas. And it was a very tragic ending. It was not set in a bright, sunny Virginia beach. It shouldn't be. That, the mood should be like a, a, like a Virginia beach at dawn, where it's misty and foggy and cold and damp. And, then we had, OK, this, OK, maybe I need to point it there. OK. We originally had a turkey in the movie. And the turkey was doing slapstick jokes. This was totally inappropriate for the tone that we were trying to achieve at the end of it. Now, here is John Smith and Pocahontas kissing. It looks like she's kissing her grandmother. You know, that is not two lovers passionately kissing, OK? And this picture tells a story, but it, there's no, nothing here that shows that the settlers that once called Pocahontas a savage now consider her a princess. And now there's a big feast. Pocahontas is, I mean, uh, Pocahontas, I don't know where she is. I don't know if she was invited. John Smith is already on the boat. So it's like, why are we celebrating with everybody else? It just undercut the, the, the pathos that the story uh, deserved. And now John Smith is inside the boat, so how is he going to see her to wave goodbye? She's outside. He's in this tiny little porthole up there. She waves goodbye. That's the blue lines are our, our camera pull out, OK? And the ship then goes goodbye. It was like the ending of a summer camp movie. You know, see you next summer. Bye. <clears throat> it was emotionally cool. So I decided this is my chance. I requested to work on the ending of Pocahontas because I knew they needed to redo it. So I hatched a delicious plan. I saw my boss in the hall one day, and I said, I'm not going to be satisfied till I make you cry. <laughs> and what do you think the first thing I did was then, besides freak out about that I called? <laughs> yes, I watched every sad movie that I could find. I watched all the classics, you know, Romeo and Juliet. Hamlet, and that other classic, Ghost. 
But I'm, I'm thinking about it. Wait a minute. Um, nobody dies in our movie, except during the battle scene. But Pocahontas doesn't die. John Smith doesn't die. We were not making a tragedy. We were making something else. And it was a film that I watched that clued me in. Pocahontas, her wish in this movie was to persuade John Smith to believe in the colors of the wind. It was a great environmental film disguised as a love story. But it was not Romeo and Juliet. It was not West Side Story. We had the wrong paradigm. And so it was one movie that I watched that I realized we were making something else. We were making Casablanca. Rick and Elsa loved each other, but they had to part for the greater good, just like John Smith and Pocahontas. It wasn't tragic, it was bittersweet. Then I decided I'm ready to start making this, this ending. So now you'll see the new version of the ending that I storyboarded for the ending of Pocahontas. My data couldn't, I mean, not that, I mean my script couldn't change. But what could I do? With pictures, I could tell a different story, a story that the characters and the audience deserved. So I set it on a moody, cold Virginia beach. John Smith is going to leave, and I'm thinking about all the ways I can create an emotional punch for the audience, setting the tone. The settlers are there, but Pocahontas is nowhere in sight. We come into John Smith, and Thomas is sitting next to him. He's giving him some food. And <clears throat> the suspense, we needed, will Pocahontas show up? Now the audience has something to look forward to, will she? And Thomas is there, and he looks over towards the forest, and through the mist comes our star. The original version had Pocahontas standing around with everybody there already, and she didn't make an entrance as a star. This way, she became a, you know, an incredible star, and in what they often, the storyboards will always change to get better, and through, even through the ending of, you know, through the animation process. What they did later was, after Pocahontas came out, they had all the set of the other um, Native Americans bringing food through the mist as well, and it was you know, a really beautiful scene. But the early versions are you know, kind of rough and early versions. So Pocahontas comes towards John Smith, the settlers that once called the Native American savages now take off their hats in respect. Pocahontas approaches John Smith. Now Thomas takes off his hat. And she informs him that if he doesn't go back, he's going to die. She's sad at this and goes to by his side. She cradles him in his arms and he opens his eyes. He cradles her and he asks her to go back with him. And she looks around and realizes she's needed there to keep the peace. She looks up to her father for guidance. And he tells her the choice is hers. And Pohatwan, uh, Pocahontas' father, takes off the blanket and gives, gives it to John Smith and says, you are always welcome here. Thank you, my brother. Pocahontas now returns the compass and tells him, using John Smith's words, this way you'll always be able to find me. And now they go in for a kiss. And it had to be a really passionate kiss. They don't want to part, they're lovers. And I thought about how can we make this even more emotional? One is that they don't want to part and a hand taps to him, to, uh, her to leave. And the fingers linger. Little details like this tell so much of the story without words. He's brought onto the ship, carried out on a little uh, rowboat. Pocahontas gets comfort from her father as John Smith is gloated onto the ship. The flag is hoisted, the anchor's raised. Pocahontas waves goodbye as John Smith waves goodbye from the rowboat. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pocahontas is with her father. He comforts her and takes solace in her arms. She runs now and runs to follow the ship, just like maybe uh, the pre... Um, um, okay. Uh, before the um, 
the whole airport change. You know, you used to be able to watch you know, whoever, your loved ones leave in the plane, and, and I used to do that and wait, and, and that's what Pocahontas is doing. I remember that and put that into this. She goes past the, the um, we see the billowing sails starting to go out to the harbor. She's now running towards us. We see her emotions close on her face. And she runs to her favorite spot, that peak on the mountain, top, on that, that cliff that she had. And now the audience sees her as she feels, all alone but on top of the world. We cut in close to see her face. And now the leaves start blowing the colors of the wind towards the ship to fill its sails. And she watches as it sails off. Sailing off. Okay. So what happened was I didn't get to go to the screening, but I heard back afterward that there was not one dry eye in all the executives that saw that screening. So I felt vindicated. It was like, yes! <laughs> and Jeffrey Katzenberg even said, we haven't earned that ending yet with Act 1 and Act 2 in this movie. So it was really validating. But every, every time I do a storyboard sequence, it is a challenge. It's how do I find my heart and put that into it? How do I find my, my happiness, my pain, all of the emotions that we all feel as humans? How do I put it into a storyboard sequence? So I did it without changing one word of the data, I mean script. OK, at the beginning I said, when we get to the X, I'm going to share a secret with you. And the secret is I'm going to share with you the happy, the secret of happy ever after for the first time. Okay? Hollywood previously had three stories that they would tell, three classic stories. One was a fish out of water. And that's where you feel like an alien from another planet, kind of like how I feel up here today. Um, the second story is an unholy alliance, where there's two characters that are totally opposites, and they have to fight to learn how to get along. And usually by the end of the film, they're best friends. And the third type of story is boy meets girl story. And I'm sure you've heard boy meets girl, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, and boy gets girl. But what I want to know is why? Why does boy lose the girl? It just, you know, something's wrong with this. It's missing a piece. And I realize it. That's because the boy does something stupid and he has to apologize, right? So it's boy meets girl, boy does do something dumb, boy has to apologize, and then finally boy gets girl, okay? So it had that extra part, just like real life. Okay, so. Jasmine suspects that Aladdin is, uh, Prince Ali is really the beggar boy Aladdin. And she asks him about Habu, Aladdin's pet monkey. And he goes off for, so yes, no, Habu doesn't like to go out with me at night, you know, and stuff. And he's doing something dumb. He's pretending to be somebody he's not. He's pretending to be Prince Ali. And he's really Aladdin, a beggar boy. And Jasmine realizes, yes. And he's caught in the lie, and now it's too late. And he loses the girl. She's shocked that he would lie to him and he loses the girl. And even the genie said, be yourself, OK? That is one of the ways that I have found that I have the most fun up here, and like when I teach. When I can be myself, it really is a lot more fun. So however, if Jadon had been, been himself, this Aladdin, uh, Jasmine would fall in love with Aladdin, and the movie would be over in about 30 minutes. So you ha in stories, you have to not be yourself. So here's now what happens when we wish. This is the secret of happy ever after. And I have a slight warning for you. OK, it's just some little charts, so don't worry too much. It's really four simple Ws. First, we wish. Then we do something wrong. And finally, because we've done something wrong, the worst happens and leads us to a place of wonder. You throw in some hope and fear and add some expectations for good measure, and it's four Ws. The wish is what the character wants, and they go through trial and error. 
And the worst is the consequences that happen. And the wonder is the learning that's involved. It's all the stages of learning. So that's why we connect with movies, because we watch these characters going through the stages of movies. The first thing to ask is, what do you want your audience to feel? Generally, you want them to feel hope. And they want what <clears throat> they want the character to get the wish, because we all identify with the character, and we want our wishes met. But we also need terror to make things interesting. If you just got your wish, the story would be pretty boring. We need fear. And our xy axis now, the x-axis is going to be the, um, I'm sorry, the y-axis is going to be the hope and fear, and the x-axis is going to be the time of the story. So what happens when we wish? The first thing that happens is our world is not right. We wish for something to make it better. And what happens is in order to get to the next stage, you have to take action to make your wishes happen. Now the story starts to change from fear towards hope. But things are not right. When we take action, a lot of times what happens is we have, we're inexperienced. We've never done this before. Or we have psychological defenses like denial or blaming or things like that. Or maybe we just lie and cheat sometimes. And doing it wrong, it appears as if the character is getting it right, but the audience knows they're not doing it right. They're, they're doing it wrong. And what happens is when we do something wrong, we have to suffer the consequences of what we've done wrong. We have to amend our mistakes. In stories, we exaggerate the consequences so the character loses everything. We lose everything, and it feels like we are in hell. This was actually Hades, but same difference. It's a place of chaos. And it was actually this place where I learned, how, I figured out how to do this theory. I was down in hell. The, when a system is too stressed, chaos theory says that you will reorganize or die. And so you learn from your mistakes, change, and you reorganize your brain at a higher level of complexity. You're able to handle more. When you first started the jobs you're in, you weren't at a place where you could really do that. Now you're able to handle so much more. Fourth, having transformed, the character fights for what's right. They're tested to prove they've learned the lessons, and they get more than they ever imagined. If you don't learn, you have a tragedy, and the story ends right there. Wish, wrong, worst, wonder. I'm going to go through these quick. Of course, we're running out of time. The impossible happens. And so you'll never forget this. It's shaped like the spine of a dragon. And I call it the wishing dragon. Stories are how we share ourselves with others. It's our hopes and our dreams. So what do you wish for? What do you do wrong that gets in your way? Find your inner dragon and ignite your world.